I just wanted to wish you a uh, happy Thanksgiving. I know it's a few days late, but I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And also, for today's clip, I wanted to share with you some of my experiences in the intensive care unit, the, the rest of the experiences, and then the study tips. So you've asked me about study tips, and, and hopefully this will be of some help. So I think the, the take-home message, one of them, is, is that do spend the time, and this is a difficult conversation to have, but do spend the time to have conversations about death, about end of life issues with your family, and to make sure that you have those conversations. Because even though they are very difficult and it involves um, some very serious conversations, I think it's really important to have because so I've spent some time in the trauma surgical intense care unit and a lot of the patients there are young or in their middle age and they get struck down very tragically and it is completely unexpected. So the day earlier they're active in their community, they are loved by everybody, they're they, they do very meaningful things and help out a lot of people and the next day there's an accident and they are either severely injured or they die and and it's so important to have those discussions at, because I've noticed so I've been part of family meetings so to talk to families during the, the difficult decisions and as a medical student I just do mostly I just mostly observe but what I've noticed is that the families that have had those conversations beforehand and have had the clear understanding of what the patient's wishes are about whether or not they want to have a natural death or if they want to be resuscitated or if they want to be put on a ventilator for the rest of their life if part of their brain is never able to wake up those kinds of issues very difficult issues but the families that have had those conversations have always told me that it really helped it helped them through the healing process and helped them make very difficult medical decisions that that they had to make in the intensive care unit so this is something that it's a little bit out of it's it's not regular conversation topic it's not among things that you normally talk about, but I, I think it's so important to, to have the, those conversations. And I, I never talked about this with my parents until now. And, 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 and it was surprising because my mom had a different view than I did. And I, I didn't, completely did not realize that. And, and this is something that will be helpful to, to talk about and explore your religious beliefs or philosophical beliefs and with your family members and with other people who can who, who are your mentors and, and people who you respect and trust their wisdom so that's one thing the other thing is along those lines is to i encourage you this is something i learned too in the intensive care unit from the families it is really really important to try your best to take that extra time to capture memories. So memories on tape, memories on video, memories of your grandparents, and to ask them these questions like, what was it like to experience the to experience World War II or, or the Great Depression? Or do you have any thoughts, do you have any advice for me or that you want to pass down to the next generation? Or what was it like to meet grandfather or grandmother? And and what was it like to take care of my parents? Just all those kind of questions, and, and also the conversations, uh, to to have that recorded because, and this is again, this is your own. Everybody has their own viewpoint on this, but something that I thought was consistent during my time in the ICU was that when talking to families, the families who had taken that time to do so, almost always had very positive experiences. They never regretted it and they really cherished the recordings of the, those conversations. And so it is out of your way. For example, when you go to Thanksgiving and to take out your camera and to record those conversations. And because you want to, it's understandable that you want to enjoy those conversations as opposed to take out, take out a tape recorder and record those conversations and or take out a camera and record the events of people cutting the turkey or or um, or having dessert things like that but it actually ends up being some of the most cherished 
possessions, the, the videos and the and and the the recordings. Those are some of the most cherished possessions that that a family would have, at least the ones that I've talked to. So just want to pass it down to you because it's not something that most people think about. It's not something I usually think about as well. So um, okay, so that's the intensive care unit. Oh, other things to look forward to. So if you're in the intensive care unit, you might be taking care of patients who are very sick and have to get emergent procedures. So you might be part of those emergent procedures and get to experience things that you've never seen before. So for example, you might be part of a situation where at morning time, 11 a.m., everything is fine. 11.45, you go back, you do your nurse neurological status exam, you take out your pen light, you shine the pen light in the patient's eye and you notice, wow, the pupils are dilated. And what that means is that the third nerve, there's something wrong with the third nerve. And if the patient has had a traumatic brain injury, tumor, or stroke, that means likely that the brain is, is swelling up. And there's cerebral edema swelling up to the point that it's pressing the brain stem. And one of the first signs of that is that because the the third nerve gets pressed, gets compressed first by the temporal lobe in a situation like uncle herniation. And the, when the third nerve gets pressed, your pupils dilate. And that is the first signs of a very serious situation where you're going to need emergent, emergency surgery to release pressure, to, to do a craniectomy. So, so to, to walk you through that procedure, and I got to actually see one of these procedures take place and it was an invaluable profound learning experience for me but basically to walk you through that what happens is that you so you first you cut you shave off all the hair right here and then you 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 take a scalpel and then you ins, make an incision in the skin and then you peel out peel off the scalp you will do and then you start you, you take a drill and then you start drilling into the skull and you, you drill holes and each hole separates each hole is separated from the other hole by a few centimeters and then you take a high frequency blade high frequency razor and then you connect and you cut from hole to hole to hole and then you take out the skull and then you get to and then you observe and you see the the dura mater so the there's a thin, there's a thin layer that covers the brain and then you make an incision around that and then you peel that peel that off and then you see the brain and one of the things that, that really so I've seen a few of these now but what of what really struck me each time was how the brain pulses so it pulses uh, according to so if your heartbeat is pulsing then your your if your heart is pulsing, then your brain pulses with your heart. And that's something that was new to me, something that they don't teach you in textbooks. For example, if if I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, you, we usually just see the ground as, as it is. We're, we're, not, we're not really thinking about our brain pulsing 80, sec, uh, 80 times per minute or 60 times per minute. And um, so uh, after that, after you do that, you... you you then, some, some, in some cases, that's all you do. You, you release the pressure because the skull is out, and then you re and then you suture back the scalpel. So you, uh, you suture back the scalp. You reattach the scalp back to the rest of the area, and then, and then the brain now has area to swell, and then you end up saving the patient's life. And so, but sometimes you also have to do a lobectomy. So sometimes you have to go into the temporal lobe. So you have to peel back, pull back certain parts of the brain, go deeper into the brain, and then cut off some of the brain so that it doesn't keep pressing on the brain stem. Um, I think I forgot to mention, but the reason why this is so important is if the brain keeps continuing to press on the brain stem, then you, then it's life threatening because you can't, you don't have a chance to breathe or uh, your heart stops beating because the brainstem controls a lot of those key vital functions. So I'm saying this because you might get to see some of these operations occur if that happens to your patient in the ICU. And then also, um, it was very interesting for me because most students, including myself and all the residents I talked to, they don't really get much time to go shadow neurosurgeons. And so if you're interested in neuroscience, so at my school, neurology is a required rotation, but neuros neurosurgery is not. And, but, but this is a theme I've been talking about 
through the past few videos, which is that to make sure you have time to explore these fields that you never thought you would take part of. Because I remember when I saw my first emergent open brain operation, I was very, very inspired and thought, wow, um, I feel really fortunate to have been able to have the privilege of being part of this operation and to be part of observing a life-saving procedure. And, and I know that some people, that might just be enough inspiration to get them into neurosurgery. But it's one of those situations where if you, you don't put yourself in that situation, you, will, you might never know you want to be a neurosurgeon. So the, okay, so now I have a few more minutes talking about study tips. So, um, one thing I thought was very helpful is to be, to have an organized schedule. So just to share with you, at my school, there's what's called the Office of Advising Resources. And this is a center that most of my classmates, we do go to. So it's not as if you have to have a study problem to go to, but I firmly believe that all of us need study help and even people who can study well can study better if you have coaches and so I think one of the difficulties in medical school or in college is that you're often overwhelmed and it's very difficult to to be able to keep track and to study several hours every day because it's very easy to get distracted or to get tired and so it's very helpful to if there's a study center in your school I would say first of all see if there's a study center in your school and check it out go see if you can get coaching and advice from them. And then secondly, if you can't, then try to see if you can get friends, teachers, relatives to help you to help you out. It's basically akin to, let's say you're swimming or you're playing basketball. Even if you know how to shoot a basketball or you already know how to do the backstroke, it's most professional athletes, they still have coaches because they, and the coaches, they don't teach them how to shoot. They teach them strategy and how to get organized and how to train yourself, how to pace yourself in your training. And so, the, um, it's really, really helpful. I am, my friends and I, we coach each other. I coach some of my cousins and just keep keep them on track. So some of the exercises we do is that we we have everybody draw out a schedule and 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 have, for this week, draw out your hour to hour schedule, approximately. And then the, there's, so there's one column, which is what you need to do. And then there's another column of what actually happens. So, so as the day goes by, you actually write down how much time you spend doing what. So for example, from two to four, if you were planning on studying, then, in, but you only spent an hour studying, you spent 30 minutes dazing off and, and then you would write that down. And you, and then for me, I started noticing different patterns, which was that I tended to not study very well at night or when I was very tired. And so I switched my studying to in the morning. I would wake up early in the morning, I would go to bed and wind down at night. And I also noticed that during the weekends, even though I was very energized and I was all ready to go, I would often spend maybe 45 minutes studying my room and then many hours getting distracted by my room. So either doing laundry or reading a book or going online, watching TV episodes online, the, I would get very distracted and initially, I would try to overcome this by just getting mad at myself. And then finally, one of my one of my teachers in the Office of Advising Resources, she just told me, Jeff, you just need to change your environment. And so I noticed that I was much better studying on the subway and in cafeteria and restaurants. And I think it was in part because I used to study in the kitchen a lot when I was a kid. And I think I'm much more alert outside. And I feel like the alertness that I get from being outside, it translates to being more motivated, to being more focused when I'm studying. So I would often go from one end of Boston, ride the subway to the other end of Boston, get off the subway and then get back on on the other end and go there. And, and I found that it was very easy for me to, to study like that. Um, and, but initially it wasn't. I had to get in the rhythm and initially I thought I needed to only study, I could only study in, in quiet and, and I went to the libraries. And, but the libraries had computers that got distracted there. And so, I've, so play around with that. You'll, you'll find that you'll notice that certain patterns exist in your life. And for example, another thing I would like to do, I, liked, I used to do was just walk and study, walk and study, have flashcards and sometimes play basketball and run from one end of the court to the other with a flashcard in hand because it just, it gets boring sometimes when you have to study four or six hours a day and you wonder and, uh, and things like that. So, 
Anyways, I hope this was helpful. Definitely be creative. Notice these patterns. Don't blame yourself if you're having trouble studying in one, one environment. I'm sure you are not lazy. A lot of people just blame their, themselves. Don't blame yourself. Just switch your environment, just switch your strategy, and I think you'll be very successful in the end. So good luck, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks.